my heart can turn as hard as a stone But you can make it tender again with your love Stir up a hunger Stir up a hunger in my heart Nothing will satisfy me Nothing else will do Stir up a hunger
Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. continue our time of worship. Wait, it's not lunchtime yet. We have communion to do. But I show this because uh, two to three years ago, I discovered ranch dressing, and it's become my favorite. I mix it with salad, various meats, chicken, even goes well with a sp spicy cucumber salad. I mean, it goes well with spaghetti also, and even with Korean barbecue if you haven't tried that. So now I mix everything with ranch dressing on my plate, if it's there. It's like a filter on my plate, almost. It's not unlike when I accepted Christ in, in the 1990s. Everything I thought of and everything that I did went through this new uh, set of taste buds of, of Christianity. And I taste tested everything by the Bible, whether I was studying in medical school, helping others, and even in friendships. So everything was new back then. I mean, even, even reading through the, the Gospels for the first time. I mean, when was the last time you experienced a new flavor, learned a new Bible verse, or heard a new song that stayed with you, that, hummed, that you hummed days and days through your life? During this shelter-in-place time, I was reading through Ecclesiastes, and I found this, Ecclesiastes 8.15. So I commend the enjoyment of life, because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. This is spoken from Solomon, the wisest man on the earth, and this is something I have learned to take to heart during this time of uh, the COVID crisis. But if we come to communion, if you'd like to take uh, and pause the, the um, video for a moment to gather some bread and wine, please do so. But uh, while you're there in the refrigerator, do if you do have some ranch dressing, put it on your bread cracker for me. 
as this can signify the newness of Christ every morning that we wake up, like as if it was the first time that you accepted Christ, as we accept his, the bread as a representation of his body, uh, died on the cross for us, broken for us, and his blood, the forgiveness that he offers to us. Let us pray. This is from Debbie McDaniel. For just as the sun comes up every morning, we can be confident that your mercies never end. They are not based upon how we are, but only on your steadfast character. Your compassion towards us is fresh every morning and each day is a gift straight from your hand. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. You are missed, you are loved, and you are cherished. Let's pray. Great God in heaven, we ask you to be the director of our paths, just as your word said you would be. Lord, our trust is in you, and we ask you that through all the things that we hear that's going on, whether it's uh, confusing news, good news, bad news, Lord, there's just a whole lot of stuff going on. And it can be wearisome at times. Lord, please help us to hold on to you. Help us to be good servants of one another. Help us to allow the Holy Spirit to be that which is our breath and our thought and our action. 
Lord, help us to be people who are good disciples of Jesus, following in the footsteps that he has for us to step in. Lord, our trust is in your son, Jesus, and we're grateful that he taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 38. A short story about two sisters learning how to serve Jesus when he shows up at their door. Uh, sisters, families, they can be great, heartwarming. They also can have their difficult moments. And in this story, we don't catch Mary and Martha at their best. They're having a problem, but we're going to have to get used to them because we're going to see them in another couple of stories coming on up further down in the calendar. Uh, but uh, sisters, you know, in this story, they are sounding probably like they did when they were little kids. And we don't know how old they are at this point, whether this is 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40 years after being kids. But for a moment, they lapse on back. And families can be that way. You know, you watch the police shows on TV and they talk about the rap sheet, a person's criminal record, and they find out all the things that this individual did, this suspect, so forth, so on. Well, in families, we don't need to go looking for a rap sheet. We're already fully aware of everything our siblings have ever done to us or said or whatever, whether it really all actually took place as we remember it or not. But in this story right here, two sisters are being sisters. I was reading a story uh, or a memory from one sister on the Internet who said there was one time her sister asked her, Did you steal my cream-colored sweater? And the sister responded, of course I did. I'm a sister. That's what I do. Do you think somebody broke into the house and came over and picked up and said, oh, what a cute top. No, of course I stole your clothes. That's what sisters do. Well, complain. Sometimes that's what sisters to do too. And that's what we see in our story today. Verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha hap, uh, opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Ah, families, what are they like? Oftentimes we think that, uh, biblically speaking, uh, we'd like to have our families be perfect and pure. Well, to tell you the truth, the Bible doesn't have a whole lot of examples of perfect and pure families. I mean, if you were to just think about Oh, the book of Proverbs sounds wonderful, right? But they were written mostly by Solomon. Would you want Solomon's family? I wouldn't. How about David in the book of Psalms? Would you want David's family? I know I wouldn't. You go through the book of Genesis, and it starts off with brothers like Cain and Abel. And then Abraham has his wife Sarah, and then this side lady Named Hagar, do you want that? How about Isaac and Ishmael? Did they get along? Lot and his two daughters? What was that relationship all about? Jacob and Esau? Laban with his two daughters and son-in-law Jacob? Reuben and his dad's concubine? Joseph and his brothers? And that's just Genesis. Now, praise God, by the time it gets to the New Testament, we find that the presence of Jesus on planet Earth and the presence of the Holy Spirit in people's lives actually do make a difference in people's home lives. But I'm saying all this to let you know is that oftentimes we look at the Scriptures and we think how intimidating it can be, especially if in our own family lives, that there's somebody that's kind of an outlier, 
person's actually, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. We're kind of scared of what they're becoming. We're apprehensive about it. But let me tell you, there's plenty of examples in Scripture of some pretty screwed up families actually being used by God mightily. So open the pages of Scripture, and the Scripture says, come on in, you belong here. And we have two sisters here in this story, which on a bad day for them, they're normally great people, but they, um, they learn how to leave one another alone, accept each other for where they're at, and then learn how to serve Jesus in his presence. The first thing I want to look at is what we could call from Martha's point of view, the need for hospitality. See, Martha is just like the previous story that we took care of last week, the story of the Good Samaritan, also a story about hospitality. Martha is kind of put in the back seat as far as this story goes, but can you imagine the story beforehand if the Good Samaritan wasn't excellent at hospitality? What if the Good Samaritan was like Mary? And when he saw the man beaten up alongside the road, he just goes and sits at the man's feet and says, hey, if you have anything you want to say to me, I'm here to listen. But no, the Samaritan had to be good at hospitality. Martha was excellent at hospitality. Lydia in the book of Acts chapter 16 was awesome at hospitality. In Luke chapter 8, it talks about a whole network of women that was around Jesus who were great at hospitality. Hospitality is awesome. Hospitality is one of the spiritual gifts. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, a great couple of verses about uh, hospitality being a spiritual gift. It says, verse 9, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stu- servants or stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Listen, hospitality was key for Jesus. Some of the greatest stories that happened in the Gospels The greatest teachings, the greatest miracles happened at banquets, at festivals, around tables full of food. And let me tell you, if we don't have those banquets and festivals and tables full of food, I'm not positive that we have all the great stories of the teachings and miracles that we would have had. Hospitality is a springboard for the Word of God and is to be highly valued. Well, let's look at things now from Mary's point of view. And that's kind of the need for being a listening disciple and the need for being a listening disciple. Mary of Bethany was sitting at Jesus' feet. We don't know if Mary actually lived in the house that Martha was the head of the household of. She might have lived close on by and she called Mary to come on over and help her to take care of Jesus and his 12 disciples and who knows, maybe the 70 guys that were around uh, coming with them. And instead of Mary actually turning out to be a help, she actually became just an extra mouth to feed. But Mary knew where she belonged, at the feet of Jesus. And that's where it describes her sitting. Which is kind of odd because women didn't sit at the feet of a rabbi. Only men got to do that. But she wormed her way in and sat right at the feet of Jesus. And it seems like Jesus loved having her there. Loved her being that one to break that glass ceiling and belonging at the feet of Jesus. This isn't the only time that we'll find her at Jesus' feet. The next two stories that we come involving this household, the resurrection of Lazarus, and then after that, at the banquet where Mary anoints Jesus' feet, she is always at the feet of Jesus. Good chance when you go to heaven and you see Jesus, and if he's sitting up at his throne, you look down at his feet, and most likely... My guess, you'll see Mary of Bethany sitting there at his feet. That's where she belongs. Something really critical here. A great verse, Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, says this, Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Let me do that again. It's a great memory verse. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Can you practice the closeness, the nearness of the Lord. I was reading a lady's uh, testimony about how she combined this verse with Mary's story about sitting at the feet of Jesus and how she just adapted her life at home by herself, practicing the presence of Jesus in her place. So she would be there and say, oh Jesus, I got a knot in my shoulder. Can you kind of work it out with me, please? And then she'd say, oh Jesus, I'm hungry. Why don't we get a snack? What do you think we should have for a snack? And she'd make the snack. 
Then you go in the living room. Jesus, how about a little bit of TV? What would you like to see on TV? And as the day went on, she just practiced that closeness. You see, God is probably pretty used to people envisioning him on a big throne, high and exalted, transcendent above and everything else. In this story, it seems that Jesus really enjoys being a person who is just snuggled up close to in a very close manner. Being near Jesus is what Mary knew was her thing to do. Now, in these two, both Martha and Mary, Jesus never tells Martha to get out of the kitchen because she's making up too much noise and come and sit and listen to him. Neither does he tell Mary, hey, Mary, get back to the kitchen. No. Wherever each lady found herself, that was where she was supposed to be. What he does do in this situation, though, to help these ladies to know how to pursue ministry with him, he says for two things to take place. First off, he talks about the need for simplicity. The need for simplicity. Tells Martha that she is worried and upset about many things. Old King James word, cumbered about. The idea of the Greek word in there means to be almost like drawn and quartered, like back in the Middle Ages, they had tried to tie a horse to each different limb and have them send them in different directions. That's the idea here. Too many things that Martha is trying to do at once, and it's just making her heart very bitter, running around like a chicken with her head cut off. In this preparation burdensome time, she's uh, losing her... Uh, enjoyment of Jesus. She accuses Jesus. Jesus, don't you care that I'm doing this by myself? Then she routes a rebuke to her sister through Jesus. Not a good thing. If you're going to do your rebuking, do it yourself. Don't route it through religion. And so she uh, uh, gets a dig in it at um, Mary on this, and it's just poisoning her heart. She needs to learn and Mary also has to learn to let the other be, to appreciate each other for what they do. A great memory verse for Martha at this point, be First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. It says this, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Saying it again. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He does. Listen, there are many things we want to do But the Lord says here there's only one thing that's necessary. One. If you have a bunch of things you want to accomplish for the Lord, how about getting rid of all of them except one? If you have a bunch of spiritual disciplines you want to get better at, sounds great. How about getting rid of all of them except for one? Once you get that one done, then you can do the rest. But focus on one because only one is necessary. Hey, the Lord made a great feast for 5,000 people off a one little boy's sack lunch. He can do great things with simplicity. But the last thing I want to point out is that there is a need for Jesus to dish up, for Jesus to be the one to do the scooping and the dishing up of the food. Here's the interesting thing. Jesus says to Martha that Mary has has her portion, her division, her scoop, and it will not be taken away from her. The Greek word there is merida. Neat little word. It's sort of like if you're looking at a pizza and it's sliced up in eight slices. Each slice would be a merida, a section, a division, a scoop. You know, if you uh, have your preferences about certain portions of things, for instance, like myself, if I have lasagna, I'd like to have a corner piece or maybe a piece along the edge. Why? Because I love the caramelized cheese that gets burnt on the edge. It's wonderful. There are certain sections that we like better than others. Maybe prime rib. People like theirs from a certain section. Maybe if you're a cake person and you love the frosting, you want the edge or the corner piece, right? If you don't want frosting, you want the middle, right? Stay away from the little sugar roses that are on there. Hey, and I'm not that good of a Christian. If I see a big slice of apple pie, fruit pie, whatever, I love those. And if there's one pie piece that's slightly bigger than the others, I don't mind being the one to take it. I like it. Jesus is saying, Mary made a choice. She has her piece. It's been scooped up. It's in her plate, and it's not going to be taken away from her. See, Jesus is telling Martha something here. Martha, you thought you were the hostess. 
you're the one cooking? No, Jesus says, I am the one that's cooking. I am the one that is serving and scooping out to Mary and Martha and the disciples that which they should have. Jesus' word was food. He talked about the lady who is wanting living water. The living water is the word. The bread from heaven for people who wanted more free bread like manna. God's word is the bread. And so Jesus' teaching is the food and he is scooping out things to go on out. What he's saying here to Martha and Mary is that he is the one who scoops. He is the one who serves. And in so doing, he is challenging them to be in their ministry complementary with what he's trying to do. Let's put it this way, using the food analogy. You know, if Jesus is bringing battered fish, we're bringing the chips and the hush puppies, right? If he's bringing the barbecue, we're bringing the baked beans. If he's bringing the apple pie, we're bringing the vanilla ice cream. When there are certain things that the Lord is working on, if there's somebody in need of repentance, that's going to be a different approach than a person who's been wounded in their heart and in their spirit. Or a person who's just tired but needs encouragement. They're all different. Find what Jesus needs for the situation and do the one thing that complements what the Lord is trying to serve up in those places. You know, Mary and Martha wanted to serve the Lord the best they can, and it needs to be our quest to be able to do what the Lord would have us to do at this chapter of our lives. Um, the church and Christians, the gospel, has plenty to offer to people right now. You know, a lot of people are desperate, and they're crying out to God. They're praying to God. Who's going to teach them about prayer? Who's going to join them about prayer? There's a lot of people wrestling with guilt. These are primal things. Oh, I wish I could have made up with so-and-so, but now it's too late. Oh, how I wish I had those years back again. Guilt. What do you do with guilt? What do you do with worry? What do you do with the idea of I should serve my fellow man? I mean, you just take those four ideas which are primal. You take it to the grocery store and you won't find nothing there for that. You go to school, you'll find nothing there for that. You go to city hall, you'll find nothing there for that. You come to church. You come to the scriptures. You come to the Christian. You come to Jesus Christ, and you'll find plenty. And that is our call, to be able to find out what God is doing in each of those situations and then find out that one thing we can serve that complements what our Lord is serving up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, help us to follow your cues and to be faithful in what we would want to do in uh, complementing your role in this wounded world Lord, help us to be there. Help us not to be complaining. Help us not to be comparing with what we're doing versus somebody else. But enjoy in our own way with the strengths and the gifts that you've given us to serve faithfully in your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.